In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about linearizing nonlinear systems of differential equations. So oftentimes, uh, we have a system of differential equations, and that system is nonlinear. And let's just recall what it means for a system to be linear. A linear first order system of differential equations is one that follows the following format. dx dt equals some constant a multiplied by x plus some constant b multiplied by y where a and b are some uh, real numbers and dy dt is similar uh, except the coefficient of x and y could be different hence we'll call them c times x plus d times y so this is considered a, a first order linear system and um, any situations in which there's for example let's say a product of x and y that is no longer linear that's a nonlinear term um, if you think about it from the perspective of this is a variable and this is a variable, then they don't necessarily co-vary in the same way. And as a result, um, you, you have products of variables, which is no longer a linear function or something of the form a times x squared is no longer linear by definition. Before, so before we move on, we will need just a brief intro to, to matrices and uh, linear algebra. There's a whole course on this, so we just intend to kind of define some of the basics here. So a matrix or an array is a table of data of size R rows by C columns. So whenever we describe a matrix, we often give it a matrix name, which is often a capital letter. And uh, then there are entries inside of this matrix, for example, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, negative 5. And um, for all intents and purposes, we uh, aren't going to describe what these values mean here, but this thing is described in terms of its dimension. It is of dimension R by C, or in this case it has one, two rows, and one, two, three columns. So this is what we'd consider a two by three matrix. So sometimes we'll write A with a subscript of two by three to indicate that that's the size of the matrix. Okay, so we can also, we can perform some operations on matrices. We can scalar multiply a matrix. For example, if I take, uh, if I define A to be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then I take 2 times A, the a constant multiple of a matrix results in multiplying each entry of a matrix by such a constant. So in this case, we're multiplying the elements in A by 2, so I'd have 2 times 1, 2 times 2, 2 times 3, and 2 times 4. So fairly intuitive in terms of how that works. And so I'd end up with 2, 4, 6, and 8. So that's scalar multiplication. The other thing I can do is if I have matrices that are the same size, that's key here. So if I have two 2 by 2s, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I define that to be matrix A, and then I give matrix B an assignment of 5, 6, 7, 8, then Addition or subtraction are element wise, meaning that one and five get added together. So that means I'll have six in that first entry. Then two and six get added together since they're in the same position. That gives me eight. And then uh, three and seven get added together and that gives me 10. And then four and eight get added together and that gives me 12. So that's how matrix addition works. Matrix subtraction would be technically the same thing. Now the real uh, important part is matrix multiplication, and while matrix multiplication can be somewhat cumbersome, we're only going to look at matrix multiplication by a vector. Now a lot of times we're going to be working with, um, in our situations, we're going to be working exclusively with square matrices, and square matrices are just that. They are square dimensions, so uh, we often could think of this as being 2 by 2 or a 3 by 3 or a four by four. So we'll only focus on those cases here. So let's just say that uh, we want to multiply a matrix by a vector. Now vector is uh, simply a, a one dimensional, uh, a vector could be two by one or three by one or four by one or technically even, so these are called column vectors because it has a single column, but uh, you could also have row vectors. We're just gonna focus on column vectors here. Okay, so let's just say we have a, a matrix that we define to be, again, one, two, three, four. And then we have some vector, and oftentimes with vectors, the way we denote that is with a lowercase and a little half arrow above that to indicate that, that what we're to write next is a vector. Sometimes you can also use 
a matrix notation. Instead of using vector, you can just call it capital X and just make it a two by one matrix because a, a vector is a matrix, but a matrix is not necessarily a vector. Uh, so let's say we have a couple of elements in here like one and four. And so what we aim to do here is we aim to multiply a by vector x. And the way this takes place is the vector elements are scalar multipliers of columns in the first matrix. The sum of these multiples is taken. So what that means is essentially, uh, if you think about it visually, and I'll kind of do a little visual illustration down here. If I have the, the matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, and if I just kind of elevate the 1, 4 vector a little bit, then if I were to kind of tip it over, then it tells me uh, you'll be able to really quickly visually see where those scalars land. So the, the, the value of 1 would land on top of this column, and the vector uh, the value 4 would lap, uh, land on top of this column. And so what I'm going to do is that first uh, element acts as a scalar multiplier of columns in the first matrix. So 1 will scalar multiply the 1, 3 vector. Okay, and uh, the 4 will scale the 2, 4 vector. And so as a result, my answer will be 1 times 1, 3 is 1, 3. Um, and it, we, we take the sum of these two multiples. So that means we're going to have 1, 3 plus, let's see, this is 4 times 2 is 8. 4 times 4 is 16. And so my answer is going to be 9, 19. Okay, so notice that we started with a 2 by 2, multiplied it by a 2 by 1, ended with a 2 by 1. And uh, we could also repeat this process for a 3 by 3. Let's say we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And I scale it by, let's say, uh, 2, 1, and 1. Okay, so again, very similar process. Uh, if we were to kind of lift this vector up, then the 2 would multiply all the elements in the first column, the 1, all the elements in the second column, and the third one, uh, all the elements in the third column. So what this would look like is... 2 times the vector 1, 4, 7, plus 1 times the vector 2, 5, 6, plus 1 times the vector 3, 6, 9. And then that, uh, that summation will be the final uh, elements in the matrix, which uh, this will give me 2 plus 2 plus 3 is going to be, let's see, 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 3 is 7. Uh, 8 plus 5 is 13, plus 6 is 19, and 14 plus 6 plus 9 uh, is going to be 29, if I've done my arithmetic correctly. So that should be the answer that we get, is 7, 19, 29. Again, started with a 3 by 3, multiplied it by a 3 by 1, ended up with a 3 by 1. Okay, so that's just a little bit uh, dealing with matrix multiplication, and that's about all we need to be uh, as powerful as we need to be. Okay, so um, let's get back to the idea of linearization. The main principle behind linearization is that we can solve uh, first order systems, but we don't have a systematic means of set, uh, solving nonlinear systems. So uh, for first order linears are fine of that form that we mentioned earlier back here. Looking back at this form is fine. We have a systematic method to solve, can solve, and that's either with Laplace transforms or eigenvalues and eigenvectors. These can be solved, but um, nonlinear systems can't be solved. So the purpose is, and I'll write this uh, as a purpose to solve a nonlinear system. Well, how do we do that? Well, the idea is that we, we are going to linearize the system. In other words, we're going to take a nonlinear system and make it linear. Uh, the idea is this. If we have an initial condition close to an equilibrium point, then certain terms are more negligible than others. For example, we know that one of the equilibrium points of this predator-prey model is that if there are zero rabbits, zero foxes, then you have 1.7 times 0 minus 1.1 times 0 is 0. Um, negative 0 0.8 times 0 plus 0 0.6 times 0 is 0. So 0, 0, 0 times 0, no rabbits, no foxes, means you're not going to have a rate of change in that population. You'll have a zero rate of change. So um, if we are near this equilibrium point of zero rabbits and zero foxes, then we're not saying that there aren't any. We're just saying near those values, near that equilibrium point, 
then certain terms are negligible. Well, if we take a look at this first equation, then which term would, would we say is more negligible uh, when r and f are both zero? Well, if r and f are both really close to zero and you multiply a close to zero value times a close to zero value, you get a value that's even closer to zero. So this term is probably negligible or is approximately much closer to zero than 1.7 times r will be. Similarly, down here, if r and f are both close to zero, then that means this term will be very close to zero because you're multiplying two close to zero values together. And so as a result, we're going to end up with uh, values of probably, we could probably reduce these to 1.7r and negative 0.8f. So that means our system is now linearized. This term is a linear term. This term is a linear term. So if our uh, differential equation can be reduced to these two, then that makes it much more convenient to work with. All right, so this is just kind of the intuition behind it. What can we basically omit or how can we modify the model? Now it's going to be an estimate. It's not going to be exact, but it will allow us to, uh, to get a, a, a solvable model. So how are we going to do this? How do we decide which terms are negligible? Well, the idea is, is kind of by using the concept of the derivative. So find the instantaneous rate of change at the equilibrium point in both directions, in the r direction and the f direction. Then assume this instantaneous rate of change is relatively constant near this point. The thing that allows us to do this is what we call uh, the Jacobian matrix. Now the Jacobian matrix is a uh, first of all a matrix so that that's important and there are a couple of things that we're going to need here in terms of the background but first of all uh, if we have a, a nonlinear system it's of the form dx dt which is a function of potentially both x and y and we have the second differential equation in that model dy dt which is potentially a function of a different function of x and y its jacobian matrix at the point x not y not the initial condition is the matrix um, and we write it this way, capital J of X naught Y naught is the following derivatives with respect to different variables. So this is the partial derivative notation. Um, partial derivatives we use if there are multiple variables and we want to specify which one uh, we're holding constant and which one we're allowing to vary. So first of all, let's think about this uh, system down here. Uh, its linearization is going to be of the form dy dt equals j times y. Well, how are we even dealing with matrices to begin with? So let's think about this. Let's say I have a, uh, a system that's of the form dx dt, and I'm, I'm just going to write a simple linear system. I have 3x plus 2y, and dy dt equals uh, 4x minus 8y. Okay, well, it turns out that if I, I can turn this into a matrix equation, if I write dx dt, dy dt. So this is a two by one vector containing the change in x with respect to time, change in y with respect to time. And then I'm going to equate that to the elements 3x plus 2y and 4x minus 8y. Well, it turns out if I, uh, if I, if I look at this as the vector 3, 4 scaled by x and the two negative eight vector scaled by y, then what I can do is I can actually uh, write down the coefficients, three, two, four, negative eight, multiplied by the vector x, y. So what we've done here is we've worked backwards and we should be able to check that if we, if we multiplied this two by two matrix by this two by one vector, we should get three x plus two y and four x minus eight y. So this just this has now allowed us to write a system of equations in matrix form, okay? And this uh, this vector or this matrix right here is what we often refer to as the coefficient matrix, because it contains the coefficients of the variables. Now these don't have to be constant; these can be non-constant, and these of course are the variables. And so to put this into write this in a matrix form, oftentimes we write this as d capital y dt 
So that's the, the derivative matrix. And then we often call this guy down here, we just call this capital X, since that contains the variables and we're just used to calling variables X. So uh, the coefficient matrix, we often call matrix A. And so this system can essentially be written in the form D 